Atlanta cinematographer Christian Sprenger, an Emmy Award winner for the comedy series and a four-time Emmy Award nominee, including two nominations this year for Atlanta and Station Eleven. But we're going to talk about Atlanta. I want to start broadly, Christian. You've done, you did every episode of season one and season two. Coming into season three, after such a long time away from the show, I guess, how did you guys talk about, you know, how you wanted to reestablish the show visually and where you wanted to go for season three? You know, each season that we've done, or at least season two and season three, we both kind of had like an overall um, thematic approach from the, you know, from the writer's room on. And so um, season three, we, we kind of knew that we had this somewhat loose, um, I wouldn't say horror, but maybe like ghost story theme that kind of uh, strings throughout each episode. And so we we knew that we were going to have uh, a rather darker and and moodier season. Uh, we actually shot um, Stephen Murphy, uh, who's an incredible BSC uh, cinematographer, um, shot our European episodes. Um, I took a hiatus uh, as I was having a baby, uh, and my family's having a baby, and and uh, so they shot the European episodes, and then we came back. Um, shot season four along with the episodes, uh, uh, my episodes of season three, which are all standalone, basically like short films. Um, we did four um, where we didn't have any of our original cast in there and, and they were kind of their own. Um, each one had its own uh, aesthetic, uh, aesthetic that very much, uh, you know, differentiated from each other and, and, and strayed somewhat away from what the show's aesthetic is. Um, but but yeah, overall, you know, we knew that there was going to be this um, this new kind of look established, and um, you know, the look, like I said, changed from episode to episode. But we knew that there was going to be this kind of through line throughout, uh, and you know, also we knew that the show hadn't been on the air for you know four years, and so uh, in particular, uh, this episode, you know, was very important to us that we kind of came back with a bold statement so so you mentioned the horror aspects of it or like the ghost aspects of it obviously i think so the episode is three slaps it was the season uh three premiere first episode that's you're nominated for i was like i just was riveted from the first from jump basically you have this scene it reminded me a little of uh twilight zone the movie i don't know if you're familiar with that but like albert brooks and dan Aykroyd in the car and it has that same kind of thing where you have these two characters we've not seen before talking on like a boat in a lake and ends up having a really good twist ending and it's just is completely unsettling and yet immediately you're like in on it and i found that throughout the whole episode i was just riveted by the fact that like you said like this is a standalone episode not the main cast donald glover appears at the very end but as a viewer i'm immediately able to like ascertain like who these characters are why i'm rooting for them what they're doing and i obviously that's in the writing but i think visually it, it really you the way you're telling the story visually is just so incredible and able and so economical in that regard i guess can you talk about how you guys discuss that and are able to like generate that kind of like immediate response from a viewer yeah i mean it was a, it was a major concern of ours something that we wanted to handle very delicately because you know we knew that the audience was going to be uh very thirsty for our main cast to be back on screen and we're delivering the premiere episode with none of those cast members. And so, you know, it, it felt pretty clear to us that we needed to like deliver something that was that you immediately identified with and could, uh, you know, start to uh, have sympathy for this main character and follow along this main character's story. And so the boat scene that you're referring to at the very beginning, you know, that's somewhat of a mission statement for the whole episode. I mean, it, you know, that the, those characters basically like lay out what the season is thematically about, about to be in, you know, in front of you for the next 10 episodes. Um, and so we knew that wanted to be treated separately. And then the story of Aquarius, which is actually based on true story. Um, you know, we immediately had to lock into, you know, you identifying with and, and uh, wanting to sympathetically follow this, this young boy. And so everything that we did, uh, you know, from a coverage standpoint, from a production design standpoint, from, you know, lighting and, and, and camera work, everything wanted to service, you know, locking the audience into this little, little kid's storyline. Can you talk a little about how you work with uh, Hiro Mirai, obviously directed this episode and, and you, he's an incredible director and you guys work so well together, obviously. Uh, can you talk about how you guys work together and like what that relationship is like and how it's kind of evolved ac across the series too? And I know you've worked on Station 11 too, but for Atlanta. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. We, we've we've worked together now for probably going on eight years, and uh, I don't know. We, you know, we, it's just that that incredible uh, scenario where you click in with a director and you see things the same way, and you have, you know, I think we both have very similar tastes, and, and at the same time, we've sort of developed our tastes together over, you know, the last um, almost decade, and and. Uh, you know, I think our process is a very, you know, free flowing sort of organic process. We had these scripts really, really early. And so we spent months talking about this script uh, a, a lot more so in terms of execution. There's a lot of like pretty complicated execution um, beats in this episode, but, you know, we had just sort of generally, we had a very good understanding of what this meant uh thematically and i think we we really try to tell the story from that standpoint first and foremost and let that inform all decisions you know all of our color palette decisions all of our you know uh contrast ratio decisions and uh color correction all of that stuff everything really needs to get motivated and, and decided through the lens of you know who who are these characters what is the story we're trying to tell and, I, and he and i both I think uh, value that type of an approach, um, and so yeah, that's you know we we spend a lot of time breaking down scripts and 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 really discussing story and characters. For this three slaps episode, what was something that was incredibly difficult to execute, or like a shot that you guys were like really kind of trying to you know untangle? I guess. I mean, I would say the the final sequence uh, with you know the van crashing over the bridge. Uh, very, very complicated. It took, you know, a couple of weeks of rigging. We shot it in basically sort of like a, uh, a stretch of road that cut through some protected land. And so there was like absolutely no lights there whatsoever. So we, we built and lit, uh, light posts for like two mile stretch and laid, you know, we had something like seven different generator placements with seven different condors, you know, basically lighting 360 in the middle of these woods and shooting, you know, at the end of November uh, with a child in rain. It was a very complicated <laughs> situation. It took several days to shoot that sequence. Uh, it took a lot of coordination and, you know, it was, there were times where were very, very dangerous scenarios, but uh, you know, pulled it off pretty well, I think. When you guys are doing, like you said, like have, getting, like treating these each of these episodes as like its own short film almost, right? Like how much freedom does that give you as a cinematographer then to like experiment and try different things even away from like, you know, a typical, whatever, I don't even know what a typical episode of Atlanta would be at this point because they're all just so different and they all have the similar, oh, like a different flavor and stuff. And that was one of the things I really loved about this season. So I guess for you as a cinematographer, how exciting is that on the stuff, on the episodes you're working on to get to like kind of flex like that? Very exciting. I we actually shot season four first, which is uh, not to give anything away, but just very much like the sort of back to the standard what Atlanta looks and feels like. And so we shot an entire season of season four, and then we ended and we went on hiatus, and then we ended with this block of season three episodes. And so the season three the standalone scripts were sort of like these uh, celebration of us, you know, finishing the show and also you know, having the right to break out of the aesthetic of the show. And, you know, we did, again, we did talk a lot about how, the, you know, we don't want people to not realize uh, that this is still the same show. Um, so, you know, there was, there was a lot of discussions about like, at what, what parts of our language, our visual language do we want to preserve? And what parts do we want to explore or push into other boundaries? And so, that was a constant discussion uh, in pre-production, in production, you know, in lighting and camera movement and a huge discussion in the DI as well. You know, we, we wanted it to feel different, but we didn't want it to feel so different that it felt not like our, you know, language, I guess. What was one of the visual language uh, things that you kind of held on to, I guess, before we wrap up here? Because I find that fascinating. I mean, I you know, I think the show, we try to approach the show from a very like, uh, Vision, like a naturalism, uh, dark, moody naturalism, I guess I would call it. And, and that was something that I think we, we realized was important to preserve. It would feel weird if all of a sudden we were doing a bunch of studio lighting and backlights and, or, or hard, you know, hard lighting that didn't have motivation. And so I think from a, from a lighting aesthetic, that was something that, you know, we understood was something 
to preserve. Um, and, and I think the, you know, the DI ultimately we used our same colors to Ricky Gosses, who's been on the show for the whole run. Um, and I think he brings a lot of continuity, um, to the show as well. So, yeah. Incredible stuff. Atlanta cinematographer, Christian Springer, an Emmy, Emmy award winner and a nominee this year for Atlanta. Thank you so much. Thank you. Marcel Rev, Euphoria cinematographer, a two-time Emmy nominee who was nominated this year for Outstanding Cinematography for a single camera series, one hour for the Euphoria season two episode, The Theater and its Double. I absolutely love this episode. It's one of my favorites of the year. But broadly, before we get into it, I wanted to talk to you about the particulars of this season uh, where you, you and Sam Levinson decided to shoot season two on a uh, 35 millimeter Kodak ectochrome, I believe. And why that choice and how did that affect your, you know, what you were doing here in season two? Yeah, it's not entirely ectochrome. It's um, I would say it's like 50, 50. Like we we shot Mission Three for for almost the half of it, and especially this episode, most of it is on on five hundred T. But yeah, we shot a lot of ectochrome too, um, and in in places that you probably wouldn't <laughs> in a normal scenario. Yeah, we we always wanted to shoot film. First season, we were it was it, we didn't have the resources and also just HBO was not totally happy about um, going analog, but with the second season, they trusted us. So we could do whatever we wanted, I think, in terms of the stock. That's great. So for this episode, I absolutely uh, love it. So let, it's a, for, for those who haven't seen it, it's basically Lexi Howard, the character has her play, a school play. It is completely blown out. And uh, just like no school play I've ever, ever seen. And you're obviously recreating scenes from the show and, it's, it's very meta and all these different things. I guess, where did you go, where did you start visually and how you wanted that to look kind of going from the stage version of like the recreations to like the real scenes from the show and how that kind of all blends together? Yeah, so uh, we definitely didn't want it to do like a realist uh, high school play. Uh, the, the idea was to, 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 um, to connect or intervene these storylines, like the, the flashbacks of what actually happened and and how she puts it on 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 stage, and 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 the third line of of things, which is uh, which is kind of the present or future of these characters, and we wanted to blend it together so you don't exactly know where you are at a, at, at certain points of the story. You can decide whether this you're you're seeing something happening on stage or it, this is actually that happened or is it an interpretation of someone. So so we were trying to create these sets. On the uh, in this auditorium that resemble um, the actual actual lo locations or sets of of or, or apartments of these characters, uh, so we can create a scene on a stage set that can be get that can feel like it's an actual scene in an actual actual apartment, and then we can reveal that it's uh, it's a scene on stage. So cool. So also, I feel like you do a lot of great work with the lighting of it, too, and kind of like tricking the viewer, I guess, by like, you know, playing into the, the theater lighting. I found that stuff so fascinating. Can you talk a little about how you guys thought of lighting and like how you did that in the auditorium, I guess, or how that even worked? Yeah, so so we I think we embraced the the nature of like th theater lighting. We kind of mixed it a little bit with 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 how we would light this show. Uh, but what we used a lot of like hard uh, spotlights on sets and on 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 scene, at scenes where we are not on stage, and try to, to connect certain uh, moments with 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 like these in camera light cues and and uh, hard lights hitting uh, actors on in places where it's not really realistic. Can you talk a little about the backstage aspect of it? So obviously, Lexi, when the show, when the when the play goes backstage, it is very frenetic and like kind of everything's moving around really, really uh, quickly and aggressively. And I just found that so thrilling. It I mean, I, I know that Sam has talked about Magnolia as an influence. It reminded me a little of like the scenes from like the quiz show on Magnolia, right? Like that kind of thing. I don't know if that was something you guys talked about, but I just for me, that was what I was taking from it. I, can you talk about doing that and how you juxtapose, like how you differentiated those scenes from the stage scenes, I guess? Yeah, it, I, we thought it's a good like glue to to glue this thing together, and it can give us a little like like a good energy and speed to the to the to the episode. Uh, actually, we were talking a lot about like Bob Fosse movies, like um, Sweet Charity and stuff like that, like like getting the humor aspect of like visually getting the humor, landing on a line, landing on a movement that's like 
I don't know, like these fast pans and, and I mean, and, and, or, or just like a, a slow move over to someone revealing someone behind the wall or stuff, stuff like that. Um, uh, that was kind of what we were watching I, as far as I remember and we're thinking about, and also just, just, just um, moving camera on rhythm, landing on a, on a musical cue, stuff like that. How much rehearsal do you, or how much prep, like how do you, how do you, how much do you have to do to make sure this stuff is timing out right? It's, I mean, for, for the choreographed parts of it, like dance, mo, dance or dance like um, uh, sequences, we rehearsed a lot. And obviously the, the, they rehearsed separately and then we rehearsed with camera, but also we took our time shooting it, to be honest. And, um, and also um, the good thing with Sam is that we do rehearse a lot. We do have like a lot of, <laughs> we have like shot lists and, and we, we mostly storyboard everything but sometimes we just throw it away on the day if we don't feel like it's it's clicking totally uh so it's a good combination of like improvising and and having a plan was in this episode was there what was there something where you were just like let's just throw like some kind of imp improvisation like that or something you guys like let's just throw it away and try something else i mean we had a, an idea how there, there is this um there is this musical number at the end um with Austin, um, uh, who uh, it's it's uh, it was kind of like well rehearsed, and we had like a good idea of how we want to shoot it, and then like a conceptual way to shoot it, and we decided just to shoot it like you know how how I, we just wanted to give justice to the choreography. It was such a good piece that we throw it away and we just went for the the best angles and just the best moves and and uh it was just such a fun sequence we just wanted to give justice to to that yeah it's awesome that scene rules I, one of the things i mean i, I you at the season two especially obviously it was such a big hit and very well received i think and online lots of memes i'm sure you've seen this or whatever and i feel like in this so like i guess like in this episode there's one of my favorites is when alexa demi plays maddie and she's like wait is this effing play about us i've seen that so many times i feel like it is move beyond the show almost when you're shooting when you're capturing that moment in your like can you do you know like things like that are going to hit can you tell that's going to be like a killer moment oh, oh, for the yeah. show I mean, or no? also the, like there are like moments where we're just, i just can't stop laughing behind the camera it's like you can feel that it's shaking a little bit <laughs> i don't know so it's a uh, yeah yeah but um it's a fun set too it's kind of especially those moments when you have like like a lot of cast and and, and dancers and yeah we it's also like a great cast. You have a, in, in this season, you have uh, Sydney Sweeney, obviously, is an Emmy nominee this year for the show, and, and Zendaya, again, uh, a previous winner. In this episode, there's a great moment with Sydney where uh, she, uh, Cassie leaves and goes into the bathroom and kind of like is staring at herself. And she kind of, her face goes from like this, like almost like a, a black hole sun, like fake happy to like sad or like, it's just a great moment. Uh, can you talk about that? And like, and then later in the episode, you have a great close up of her. Uh, the episode ends with her like looking through the glass door. I, I found both those scenes so incredible and the way you're capturing her emotions without her even saying anything. I guess can you talk about like working with her on those scenes and like getting those moments, I guess. Yeah, I mean, Sid is just like an amazing actress and 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 she can like turn this these emotions on like, I don't know. It's like, it's probably skill too, but I, I doubt it's only skill. Um, I don't know. She, I mean, she's really amazing and she goes for it even for, and I think the good thing about her is like, is, is she, it's not only the emotional parts of it, but this character is such a courageous character in a way that she's not always likable and she really goes for it. And she has that courage to like, to, to create something that's like, you know, risky. Maybe people won't like her character that much. And then she just goes for it all in <laughs> yeah. with a lot of trust, which I really admire. It's really great. And then I want to ask you just briefly, obviously, like we're talking so much about the show and, and the theater and everything. There are also scenes in Fesco's apartment, which obviously pays off tremendously in the finale. I found those scenes, the way those scenes are, like the style of those scenes are so different from what we're seeing on in the in the theater and stuff. And there's obviously so much tension built in there and the way that pays off in the finale is obviously incredibly uh, powerful and just great. But can you talk a little about uh, how you guys thought about those scenes in the apartment and how that would look visually compared to what we're seeing on in the in the show? Yeah, I think that goes back to the core of what this season is. For, for me, this season is is about like, like if I think about it, I think about like Fesco's house. I think about the house party in, in, this, in, in season one that like, or just like, or Elliot's uh, apartment that's that like black and golden um, uh, palette. 
with with a lot of colors, but that golden thing that glows over it, it's 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 a combination of actichrome and and the way I don't know, but and it's production design obviously and but um, uh, yeah, so that's and then I think the, the this episode is a little bit different. I think episode five and episode seven are a little different from from the rest of the episodes, and that's when it meets the the core of 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 this season. I think when we, when you go back to uh, to to Fasco's house, and obviously that's where it will unfold in the in the finale. So we just wanted to go with with a little more more melancholic look. I think mm-hmm. that's the right word. Yeah, that it is, and it, it works. Uh, it, it, we can talk about this for a while, but we have to wrap up. Marcel, Rapp, cinematographer for Euphoria and Emmy nominee this year. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Grown cinematographer Mark Doring Powell, a four time Emmy Award nominee and a nominee this year for outstanding cinematography for a single camera series, Half Hour for the Freeform series. Mark, you, you've done a, a lot of work on, on Grownish. Uh, coming, I guess, coming into season four, just broadly speaking, before we get into the episode and stuff, how did you guys talk about how you wanted to evolve the visual look for the show from season three and like where it was going, basically? Yeah, it, it kind of left off from season three. Um, the, the, the look kind of just flowed right from season three into this. But the this episode uh, was very special. I mean, it's a two-part episode, right? Like the it was Jennifer Rice Genzuk Henry who was our director. She's amazing. She's a comes in with a really strong vision. And th- what happens is that our gang is basically protesting um, uh, the, uh, the the police killing of an innocent black man. And so that's the previous episode where that all starts. So it's very tonally, it's just very different for us. And um, so. Uh, and, and that's how this one starts is this campus protest. Um, and we, we, you know, we, Jenny purposely didn't want this to be like a very, you know, very special episode. We wanted to keep our look going and our look is kind of like this glossy, glammy look sometimes. And, you know, we have a lot of, you know, party scenes and a loft and whatever. And, and here we're going to touch upon, you know, now we're doing these protests, which we approach three different ways. Uh, the three times that you see a protest, they're, they're approached very differently, and uh, and going all the way into sort of like a photojournalistic look, a very raw, uh, more gritty look, gritty look for the end night protest, um, and and I think that juxtaposed really well. I think that was a challenge: is how do you how do you make these fit into our world? And I'm I'm, I'm quite happy with how that turned out. That that was probably most of our discussion on on uh, on this episode: is how to how to make that fit. And of course, knowing that it would be an entirely different uh, a tone for us. So I would love to start there. Then from the you shot the, the protest, like you said, it, the episode opening is just remarkable. It almost looks like a still photograph, still photo, like you said, like a photo, very photojournalistic. And it's obviously not a still photo as we, you you see if you watch the episode. Uh, can you talk about why why start there and how you kind of like, what were you inspired by? Like, I mean, obviously like real life events are, this is not an uncommon thing seeing protests like this and certainly seeing it covered like, in 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 media but i guess how did you guys talk about like how, why start there with that visual style for the way the episode opens yeah it, it's um so the opening is the uh, is the the cold open is the the campus protest and so what's great about that is you you're in this very sort of peaceful world we have we put all kinds of blossoms on the trees and so on and you have our our main protester in like this windblown dress for blowing over the fan and it's very ethereal in a, in some ways, and um, and we so that's sort of almost like the safety of the campus, which then gets broken up by the police imposing this curfew. And what what one thing I love about the show is that it's not preachy. Like if you watch it, like right after that, our gang just disperses. Like some of them, some of them are like, "Look, I don't like rubber bullets. I'm going home. I'm out. I'm hungry. I've been here all day." You know, they split up. And that's what the story is. We follow our gang in these separate storylines through this day of protest. As some of them continue into the night, past the curfew, some go home to talk about it, and so on. And you see this conflict between uh, our gang. They're all discussing the uh, the events and so forth. Um, and then, of course, we treated the second time you see a protest differently. It's more raw. People are, you know, getting hurt. There's more chaos. And then the third one is more like the aftermath, and uh, and that one was re- is, we were inspired actually on the third one. We we had a photograph by um, uh, Julio Cortez. I, uh, well, there was a couple of 
photographs from the Minneapolis protests for the death of, uh, of George Floyd, where there was an image of a protester that was um, holding an American flag upside down, like a sign of distress. And, and they were, and they'd been photographed crossing a burning police cruiser and it's just backlighting the American flag and the protester. And we, we, we really were inspired by that and we emulated it. We, we took some liberties to make it our own, of course, but, um, but it was, that was sort of really the, the peak of the photojournalistic approach and, and more gritty uh, and, and, you know, very, a very poignant cold open, you know, and sort of like the end is also very sort of this eloquence and the chaos um, of the ending. Um, it's quite powerful. And, uh, and, you know, you get less than 22 minutes to tell a story. So everything's very concise um, to be able to convey all that. So I, I'm quite happy how Jenny uh, was able to wrangle all that together. It was, um, I was very impressed. Yeah, it's really a remarkable episode. It's so great. The opening too reminded me, there's a photo of a protester from like Louisiana in 2016, where you have the young woman like standing in front of the cops and she's so peaceful and like, they're so aggressive. And I love the way you kind of capture that too, where they're like, just, you know, going like frothing at the mouth and the the juxtaposition of those two, uh, those two, those images is just incredible. I think it really, really kind of pays off. Can you talk about like your collaboration with with Jenny uh, on this episode and, and as her as a director and stuff and how you guys kind of work together I guess I you know we depend so much on our directors right like she is truly a visionary she comes in she has a a bit of a lookbook um that she shares with us which really helps we had you know the photographs from the protests um that inspired us um so it's a lot of visual references like that there's less color in this one than a previous one that she'd done we do a lot of things with color um uh, so here we're, we we did some of that with our, we have to do a, a transition on our sets that goes from day, dusk to night so as they impose a curfew and you get the idea that we're now going in the night and that worked out really well and a little moodier conversation inside um, with the, with uh, the gang that went home um, with, uh, with Nomi, Jazz and, and, uh, and Zoe at home talking about the protests. So, um, and I think that actually those scenes really helped get us into transition us into the night the night work uh because we we're also forced to shoot the the day protest the middle protest earlier than we wanted to we would have loved to have done it at dusk but it was too much work we had started at sundown i don't tell anyone but i stalled <laughs> as long as i could <laughs> so uh, to try to get the sun as low as possible but um it, it worked it's 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 really worked out really well i thought um and i had to work very quickly to get that done um but yeah, Jenny is really just, uh, she's like, you know, she's, um, no matter how much chaos is around her, she's very calm and and she just, uh, she's just very methodical in a way and and just gets through it and finds the pieces that she needs. And she's just a great leader that way on set. And I think also the cast uh, loves her and I think they responded to her and and gave their best and um uh, yeah, I think I think really being able to prep this with her and, and with the visual references that we discussed and trying to not make it a very special episode and let it letting it fit into our world was really what what made this work. Yeah, I want to ask you. I'm glad you brought up the the scenes in the apartment with uh, Zoe, Nomi, and Jazz talking about the protests and and uh, Nomi's own blind spots about racism and and everything. I found those scenes really great. Like you said, not too preachy at all. The performances are incredible, and they're all. It's like really kind of like. I guess sensitive scenes and I think they're just really staged really well and they're very empathetic to all the characters in it. You know what I mean? Like you're nobody's being villainized there because obviously they're all friends. I, can you talk about doing that and working with the actors to capture those moments and make it feel so authentic, I guess? Yeah, I, you know, it's, there just never, we don't have heroes in this. Everybody's sort of flawed, makes mistakes. They, or, you know, maybe, maybe Nomi doesn't really know how to put things into the right words when we talk about these things. You know, these are these are all issues that that we all care about, that we talk about, and it's tricky to talk about them. You know, um, one thing that we might say, anybody might say, which might seem like an obvious thing to re- remark upon uh, with protests and rioting and so on, but it might it might really um, you know could really hurt somebody's feelings in a way because they're seeing that from a completely different perspective of of uh, of having lived a completely different life. Um, where they're on the other side of that. And, and, and I think that that is really what's so great about it, where, um, 
you know, it, it just lets it be very real. And I think we do approach things that way as well, where we, you know, we don't try to get in the way when they're doing their thing. We have, you know, two or three cameras on a lot of these scenes and, uh, and try to just, you know, let them, let, let them, you know, play the scene and not do too many pickups that let us get in the way. I think the, the interior scene is a good example of that. The, the ones you mentioned with the three of them with Naomi Jazz and, and Zoe, um, and and I think you know they're 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 strong scenes that way. You you really understand all the sides of that of that equation when they all when they all tell you. You know you can really empathize with each one, and also find fault with each one in a way, right? So I think that's what makes it really really uh, really strong. Yeah, and to do it like you said in twenty two minutes is just an incredible incredible thing. Uh, Grownish cinematographer Mark Doring Powell, uh, Emmy nominee this year for the series. Thank you so much for doing this. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Marvelous Mrs. Maisel cinematographer M. David Mullen, a two-time Emmy Award winner and a four-time nominee for the Amazon series. He's up again for an Emmy this year, Outstanding Cinematography for a single camera series, one hour for the season four finale. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? I will not ask you how we get to Carnegie Hall because I'm pretty sure that is practice, but I do want to start. You've done this show so many times, uh, you know, for uh, very many seasons. I, coming, you know, I, for season four, how did you guys talk about, you know, how you want to evolve the look of the show or anything like that, or kind of like, what were your early conversations about before we get into the specifics of the episode? The, um, the overall look of the show has been consistent, which is how do we approach this period, which is now 1960. Um, and in the early discussions on the pilot, it was basically not to go into any kind of faded sepia tone period feeling, but have everything be vibrant and energetic, with a lot of camera movement and a lot of sort of rich color saturation, uh, while maintaining a kind of realistic view of New York City at the time in terms of the design and everything. So that hasn't changed. Uh, this season, though, we introduced a whole new set, which was the Wolford Theater, which is a burlesque house. And when Midge arrives there, it's it's a little more run down. And over the course of the season, she gets them to improve their, their shows, the quality of the shows and the lighting and everything like that. So the look of that set had to evolve somewhat over the course of the season, both in production design, we added more table lamps and nicer waitress outfits and other things like that, but also the lighting cues got more elaborate. Um, and in the case of all the musical numbers this season, we had a Broadway lighting designer, uh, Don Holder, come in, and he was tasked to sort of keep it very simple in the early scenes, uh, and then he could be more elaborate as we went on, as long as it was still within what a 1960 lighting, theatrical lighting could do, you know. Um, we do cheat because any light fixtures that are off camera, we can use modern LED programmable lighting. Uh, you know, back then lighting was all tungsten. So if it uh, switched from red to blue, you had to have a red gelled light and a blue gelled light. So it quickly quadruples the amount of lighting you need if you do a lot of cues. So we, uh, we did mix in a lot of modern theatrical units to be able to to pull off these shows, but that was um, Don Holder doing the pre-light and the, and the prep and the tech, uh, tech rehearsals for that stuff. So I'm glad you mentioned the Wolford. There are two great scenes, at least in the finale with uh, the theater, right? So I, I wanted to first start though, bef the, before it gets rated, I wanted to start, Midge goes up on stage, obviously having come from the hospital where Moish, her fa uh, former father-in-law or still father-in-law, however you want to call it, is uh, had a, suffered a heart attack and he's in the hospital. She gets up on stage and does this very moving monologue. And it's I, I just love that scene so much. And I guess, can you talk about how you guys wanted to capture that? Because it's obviously slightly different from other Midge stand-up scenes that we've seen, certainly this season and on the show in general. So I guess, how did you guys talk about getting that kind of the rawness of her, you know, monologuing, but keeping it with what we've seen previously, but kind of separating, I guess. I don't know. I found it really compelling. I guess I'd love to hear you talk about yeah, it. Yeah, our, our approach to her stand-ups has generally been the same, that we give her, um, we bring in usually three cameras, uh, although this time we might have only had two because we the one thing we eliminated any kind of big showy uh, camera move, wide shots, and, you know, that was always the question with that set is, um, do we want to bring in a crane? Do we want to float around on a crane? Um, and uh, if not, uh, do we just want to start in on Midge closer? Uh, usually we we basically do our wides and then our 
we move in closer with the camera and often we'll then even get up on stage with a steady cam and get very close uh, physically with the camera with her. Uh, so that's generally been our approach to those those scenes is to sort of let her build through uh, the camera setups, um, give her kind of a master and, and a medium camera and then, and then move in one step closer. I think we just eliminated any kind of showy wide shots for that um, yeah. sequence. Uh, the uh, otherwise, you know, just playing the, the house a little bit subdued. Uh, it's always a question for us is, you know, how much do the house lights go down during these performances? Because in reality, Broadway theaters, theaters, the house lights go out during a show and it's, but we want to see the audience a little bit. So we always have a little bit of dim mm -hmm. atmospheric lighting going on even throughout a show. Right. And then later the Wolfer gets raided. It's a great scene. Uh, total chaos. I just love the way that you're just, the camera's moving all over the place. It's just an incredible, uh, very exciting moment, I think, and a very great watch. Can you talk about staging that? All the seasons have had very elaborate camera movements, uh, mostly pulled off by Jim McConkey, our steady cam operator. And this one was one of the hardest he's had to do because once Midge is talking to Lenny in the hallway, we have some coverage between them but then when she hears the noise and she says what's that it becomes a wonder all the way through the end of the sequence where we we back up with them we we whip 180 degrees we go up on stage backstage we open the curtain we see total stunt chaos people jumping off the balcony police tackling uh people you know so we had a mix of stunt people and extras all choreographed to, for chaos uh and then quickly we start to back up with them on the camera as they run out of the theater and they dive into the dressing room area um, where people are crisscrossing the frame and throwing clothes everywhere. We did quite a number of takes because being a steady cam move, the biggest problem was if the camera gets bumped at all, you see it because it's it's just floating on a, a kind of, you know, very carefully balanced. And we would get through these takes and halfway through someone because it's just a tight space, the dressing room, the hallway, um, extras are running at full speed and so is Jim. And so someone's elbow would just tap the camera or someone's shoulder would knock it and then we'd have to start all over again. Um, we had one take where we had it perfect all the way into the last frame and just someone leaving the shot hit the camera with their shoulder. So it was, uh, that was the hardest part. Jim had to do it quite a number of times because of just simply uh, getting bumped by people. Um, but we, it was a great sequence. We had a lot of uh, dancers and stunt people mixed in so, who could very carefully choreograph. Um, we wouldn't be able to pull it off without that because they really did have to cut really close to the lens constantly. Yeah, that's, it's an incredible scene. It reminds, it, what you just said there reminds me of uh, the, you know, the Goodfellas steady cam scene. I think Henny Youngman kept messing up his line right at the end. So they nail it. And then he would miss his one joke, which is like, take my wife, please. Very funny. Uh, but so it's like, oh, the camera, same kind of thing. I, I want to ask you from that kind of, you know, chaotic sequence, just incredible technical skill. The other scene I wanted to talk about is obviously like a big part of this episode is Midge and Lenny Bruce consummate their uh, longtime flirtation and relationship. Uh, and I, the scene right before they, they have sex, I just found that the conversation is so, it's just so quiet. And like, I love how they're kind of feeling each other out and, you know, figuring out how they want to take this next step. Can you talk about how you guys talked about capturing those moments and what you thought, like how you guys thought of those scenes, I guess? Yeah, it was, a, we often have long rehearsals to really nail down the blocking and performance. Um, and then uh, it was covered fairly simply, you know, two shot master, tighter two shot, uh, two singles basically. Um, mm -hmm. It was uh, nothing very complicated technically other than you have to have it snowing out the windows in almost every scene of this episode. So that was something to, to coordinate. Uh, I wanted to keep it very simple lighting wise. I, I Usually we light with soft lights with light mats, LEDs, but in this case, because uh, the room was lit with these table lamps, um, all the coverage, I just put a big bed sheet on the wall and hit it with a, a Lico to let them be lit by the soft tungsten glow from the direction of the table lamps. Um, and that was pretty much it. It was uh, just very simply shot, you know. Yeah, and it's beautiful. And then later, obviously, uh, Midge gets out of the bed and goes into the bathroom. Can you talk about that scene briefly before we wrap up? I thought that that was the way, again, the way that is staged and framed, I found really beautiful and like very 
like, yeah, like just really nice. I thought that scene was great. Yeah, I wanted to slightly um, and heighten feeling for that sequence. So I used a very um, hot spot top light on the white sink so that she would be lit by the glow from the countertop coming up at her and then her hands picking up the the case that had the heroin and the needle and all that stuff um, would sort of overexpose and glow. It's a little bit of a Robert Richardson effect, but that, so I wanted that kind of slightly heightened uh, dramatic quality. Um, also the feeling when you in a dark room lit by the moon or the street light and you go into a bathroom and you turn on the light and it's a little bit harsh and glary compared to the rest of the space. I wanted some of that feeling too. Uh, so that's it was pretty simply lit. We uh, we had to just shoot uh, towards the door in the reverse. Um, you know, it was, I think it was the classic problem of the reverse. You know, you had to cross the screen direction because you couldn't get over the same shoulder in both directions in the doorway. But uh, it didn't really matter because the geography is so clear between the two of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was just again very simple. I just wanted that that heightened feeling from the intense uh, overexposed little spot on the, on the counter. Yeah, it, it's great stuff. The, the, the whole up season was great. I think the finale is incredible as well. Marvel's Mrs. Maisel, cinematographer M. David Wallen, Emmy Award nominee this year again for the show. Thank you so much. RuPaul's Drag Race cinematographer Michael Jacob Kerber is a five-time Emmy Award nominee, including two nominations this year for Lizzo's Watch Out for the Big Girls and RuPaul's Drag Race. We're talking about RuPaul's Drag Race, though. You're the only person on this panel uh, who is nominated or among representing reality uh, programming. I guess I wanted to start there. Can you talk about like what's especially rewarding about doing cinematography for reality TV before we talk about the season in general? Uh, rewarding about reality TV? I think, I mean, ultimately, you know, we're all telling stories of one kind or another. And I think there's something that's um, especially engaging and fun about telling a person's story in real time, um, in real life. And, you know, we do our best to kind of support that and enhance that and, you know, allow the audience uh, into these worlds and hopefully, you know, bring them along um, mm -hmm. and engage them. Yeah, for sure. And obviously you do that with Drag Race. I think this was a 16 episode season, I believe. Lots of different episode structures. You have cast reunion and grand finale in front of a live audience, major events, obviously like snatch game, lip, sy lip sync stuff I, with all those different production styles at play. Like, do you have a favorite type of episode to work on? Or like, how do you kind of like, like, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? I guess. Gosh. Yeah, it is a lot. And uh, everything's a bit different. I do enjoy the, the challenges because those tend to be unique, the larger maxi challenges that we do, um, because often that's a new and different set design um, so we can approach the camera work and the lighting differently uh, so it keeps it fresh um, i like doing the runway uh, and the lip syncs are really dynamic and fun um, you know these queens are just amazing performers and artists and it's it's all uh kind of a joy to to watch and to to help document and again it's about supporting them you know i mean we're really here to to showcase them as artists and performers and drag queens. So, you know, we like to have fun with the camera work and the lighting, but ultimately we're not gonna get in the way of them. You know, mm -hmm. it's all about, to me at least, it's all about uh, showcasing them. So when you have like, you mentioned like the challenge and stuff, when you're on like a new, uh, a new set or a new environment, I guess, how much time do you have to prep and think about how you want it to look, like what you want to do visually there and how much like is, like, um, are you, I mean, yeah, like, how does that work? Yeah, uh, the schedule, I mean, as the show has grown, uh, it, the schedule hasn't. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we've always kind of had two, two days per episode, um, sometimes three. And typically there's a, a leapfrogging of, we shoot on three stages. So we have one set or excuse me, one stage that's our rotating challenge set. And that's the one that will we'll flip and get ready for the next episode. Um, so, you know, as we're shooting, let's say we're shooting a day one and we're busy with that work, we're also going on to the next stage and pre-lighting and, and blocking stuff out and trying to prep for the next day's shooting on that, on that set. Um, so that's kind of the rhythm of, of how we do it. And, uh, and then we have the runway days, which are like the, the kind of day two um, moment of an episode where someone tends to get eliminated 
uh, and they have to lip sync or they have to lip sync for their life and then one of them goes home so can you talk about the lip sync uh the, the challenge those kind of those uh you know that doing that and capturing that obviously that's such a hallmark of the show I'm like uh yeah the lip syncs well so that that is one of in addition to kind of the verite reality uh, in the in the workroom the lip syncs are truly nobody knows what's going to happen um you know we have a we have a stage so we know those kind of uh, that space and we have our pockets where the cameras are but beyond that we don't really know what the queens are going to do so it's very uh you know it comes down to the experience of the operators and the intuition um kind of getting to know the queens and how they move or when they tend to do you know drops or w whatever the movement is um so it's 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 very exciting like the, the energy level is very high for those lip syncs because everyone's very laser focused mm -hmm. uh, and making sure we don't miss anything because that that is something we can't do again right you also i mean there was another i mean i was um, i know for one episode that fans really love this year it was the moulin rouge musical episode uh which mm -hmm. was uh, moulin rouge I, I imagine that was similar right because it's like literally like a production of a musical it seems like on stage it just is so uh involved and just very elaborate i guess how was that to do and was that a similar thing where you just kind of have to like make sure you're on the ball to not miss stuff that's happening live. Yeah, the musicals, the musicals we do have an opportunity to rehearse um, a little bit with camera. The, the queens and the choreographer and the dancers do have a couple of days to rehearse um, together, you know, hours uh, in a day. But camera has a little bit of rehearsal time, not a ton. And then we usually do two takes, um, maybe a third if we want to do a uh, specialty pass where it's like just you know our uh, steady cam can get in there and get a little closer uh to kind of get some more dynamic uh movement same with jib sometimes we might have a techno crane and allow them to have more freedom um because you know part of the challenge uh, of having a multi-cam setup with you know up to 10 cameras is like each shot needs to work so you can't you know, be crossing through a lot with jibs or, you know, moving through with Steadicam, or if you are, it needs to be timed out very well and you need to commit to that is the, that's the shot we're going to take in that moment because no other shots are usable. Um, yeah. So. It's, it's amazing to hear you say that because obviously the show is, it's like the 14 season. It's such a well-oiled machine. It seems like that from a viewing standpoint. And like, I'd imagine it's, you know, it takes a lot of work to make it seem that smooth, I guess, or that effortless, right? Like from your end. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, myself, uh, Nick Murray, our director, um, he's, you know, he's great at, uh, you know, figuring out when we might be able to commit to those moments. Um, and also, you know, we just discuss how to kind of, again, make all the shots work uh, so that most, if not all, are, are usable at any moment. Do you have a favorite shot or sequence from season 14 that you were like very excited about and that paid off? I do. I know there was, I don't really follow, you know, Twitter or the social media and, you know, people talking about the show that much, but I did hear that there was a reaction to a specific lip sync um, and a moment. I think, I think it's the moment where the two Queens were on the stage and it was a very slow kind of emotional song. Uh, and they happen to line up in such a way where our jib operator, Justin Umpenauer, who's done many seasons and he's, he's fantastic. And he has a real sense of, of music and dance. And he happened to line up where they were stacked in such a way that he could do a, a rack focus from one to the other uh, in kind of a, a tighter shot for a jib. You know, I mean, he went in and, and kind of knew to, to capture that moment tighter and, uh, show that emotion. So that, that was really cool. It's fun to see in a live scenario, you know, him find that and know what story to tell in that moment. I thought that was right. cool. Yeah. It, it's incredible to hear about. Like, I mean, how do you, yeah, like how, I guess, do you feel like you're getting, I mean, do you feel like you're getting better at this as the seasons go, like as the seasons go on, like how much have you learned from like, yeah, how much you learn each season, I guess, from like previous seasons and like stuff that you're just discovering, like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that could be possible, I guess. Yeah, uh, I think that we, after doing, you know, so many seasons, you know what works or what tends to work. 
And the danger is, you know, just continuing to repeat yourself. Um, but there's only so much we can change, right? So we'll try to find moments to use uh, different camera angles or different movement, uh, introduce new lights to the, to the lighting rig on the runway, you know, to add some more dynamics or, or more options when uh, our lighting designer, Gus Dominguez, and a programmer, Andrew Law, you know, they're just fantastic at, at coming up with, with new looks and new designs for different songs, um, different, different lip syncs. So, you know, that's where we try to kind of change it up, find new things. And then again, the challenges each season, the producers, I don't know how they keep coming up with <laughs> so many new scenarios to put the queens through, but that keeps it fun and, and exciting and gives us ways to, th to think differently um, and, and approach things a little differently. We have to wrap up, but how, how early are you brought on the process when they're like con, 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 uh, concepting the season and the challenges and stuff? Like how, like when do you guys get brought in? Uh, sometimes we'll have like a very preliminary uh, phone call or Zoom call where it's like, here's kind of what the creative grid is looking like. But normally it's maybe a, two weeks out, I'd say. Wild. From, and then we, you know, we build for like a week, setting up everything and while while the build is happening and there's continuing discussions but a lot of it is very you know there's so many changes right up until the last moment so yeah. it's incredible stuff uh rupaul drag race cinematographer michael jacob kerber uh, five-time emmy nominee nominee this year as well thank you so much for doing this appreciate it thank you christian spranger cinematographer for atlanta marcel rev cinematographer for euphoria mark during powell cinematographer for gronish and david mullen cinematographer for the marvelous mrs mazel and Michael Jacob Kerber, cinematographer for RuPaul's Drag Race, all Emmy Award nominees this year for their incredible cinematography on these shows. Uh, thank you all for doing this. I wanted to start just broadly, you know, when did you realize becoming a cinematographer was something you could do or something that you wanted to do? Uh, Christian, I'll start with you and we'll go around. Um, I went to film school and I actually went to film school thinking I was going to get into um, motion graphics and visual effects and, and realized that... Um, it was way better to hang out on set with cool people than to be stuck in a chair in a dark room. Um, yeah, I, I went to school in Chicago and, and uh, there wasn't that much production there. Um, but uh, I would say, you know, performing arts school and, and um, you know, the community, the sort of artistic community in Chicago really fostered that and, and uh, made it something that could be a career. Nice. Marcel? Uh, yeah, around 16 or 17, I decided to not going to the, to get into economics, but I would rather uh, go into filmmaking. And early on, I, I, I knew for somehow, although I didn't really knew what a DP is doing, I knew that I want to be behind a camera. I don't know how. And nice. I, I went to film school too. I, I went, to, I'm from, I was born and raised in Budapest. I went to film school here and started out here. Nice. I think we're all better that you think, you know, good thing you passed on the economics, I believe. I think that was a probably wise choice. <laughs> Mark, how about you? Yeah, I guess for me, it would have started um, even in high school when my, um, my parents uh, owned a video store outside of an air base. My, my dad was in the air force there and uh, my mom's German. She still lives there. And, um, and I was, you know, in school there, I was helping out with their, with their store and I'd watch all these videos and I became maybe a little bit of a film buff just watching more movies. And then I went to school though, as a, I was majoring in painting and graphic design. And I, I went to Pratt Institute in, in Brooklyn, New York. And while I was there, I discovered in the basement underneath the gym was this little fledgling computer graphics department, which really caught my attention. At the time they had very advanced, um, uh, workstations from Alias Wavefront, uh, which became Maya 3D stations later on. And so it's just very advanced. They had, they had gotten these uh, workstations gifted to them and had like a graduate program that was working on this. And I was just, it was amazing at the time, right? To see this stuff. And while I was there, I was exposed to this little tiny film department. And that's what I ended up doing. I switched my majors in my sophomore year and decided to do film and um, you know, uh, first year I was just like running around New York doing a, like a documentary on New York, basically. That was my first project and just fell in love holding a camera and, um, you know, and, and just sort of 
you knew nothing about lighting. I just remember discovering light, lighting slowly. You just sort of discover it. You see it. You, you learn to, you know, you learn how to use a light meter, but then you realize don't set your lens at that reading. It's something else, you know, interpret it. And, and just that the joy in that was really um, just this, you know, cinematography is endlessly fascinating uh, to this day, even as long as I've been doing it, you know, you just never stop learning. And I think that same kind of infectious uh, curiosity, you get that bug and you just keep going. And, and that's, that's how I got into it back in basically back in, in film school. Hmm, that's great. Damon, uh, how about yourself? I started making Super 8 short films in high school, but I went to college as a pre-med student. But very quickly, once I got to college, I realized I didn't really want to be a doctor, and I kept making uh, short films. Eventually, I went to CalArts uh, Graduate Film School when I was about 26. But by this point, I'd been making Super 8 short films for a decade and quickly became a cinematographer at CalArts because I already knew how to shoot and light and stuff. So I've sort of fell into cinematography at Cal Arts when I was there. Hmm. That's great. And Jake, yourself? Um, I think I had a glimmer of it in high school, but at that point in early college years, I was actually in fine arts. Uh, I wanted to be a painter <laughs> or I was, you know, going down that path and, uh, but still kind of shooting my own stuff with, you know, whatever camera I could get my hands on. And then that just continued to grow and I'd always been drawn to, you know, all the elements that make make up a film, uh, you know, the visual elements, lighting and uh, camera, architecture, music, you know, all of these things. So it was, it was, I realized like, I want to do something where all of that's coming together uh, and storytelling, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it just seemed like an obvious kind of pivot for me and uh, yeah, I'm glad. Do you think being a painter helped you even more from a visual perspective as well, or wanting to be a painter like that? Definitely. Yeah. And a lot of my paintings, um, I mean, this, again, this is in like my first year of college. So very early days, but a lot of it was, was trying to show movement, you know, or trying to show almost like triptychs, like steps or, or, or like uh, different moments in the painting. So it was, I think I was already trying to like, give more movement and tell more than just a single frame uh, could, yeah. could express. Yeah. That's great. Uh, so next one would be best advice you've gotten as a cinematographer or something you took early on in your careers that you were like, wow, like, this is something I've carried with me that I still think of now as an acclaimed Emmy nominee that you all are. Uh, Chris, Christian, I'll start, I'll start with you and that uh, we can go back around. Boy, I don't know. I think, you know, I think uh, some of my most influential, you know, uh, film school teachers, I think probably some of the most uh, valuable advice was at the time in film school was, you know, to get out on set and work as much as possible uh, out, you know, outside of our curriculum and, and meet as many um, people that, you know, you like working with and, and uh, people that you like to, you know, spend 12 hours a day with. And I've been extremely fortunate to have a core crew um, that has, uh, you know, we've kind of all worked together uh, for the better half of the last 15 years. And, um, you know, it makes work not feel like work when you're when you've got your your friends with you. And, and uh, I think that's been a, a huge aspect to, you know, where I am in my career right now has been the, the people I've been lucky enough to work with. So yeah, that's great. Marcel? <clears throat> Uh, it's not really a, an advice, but something I learned throughout my film school years is that from mostly from fellow students is that that you it's worth trusting the people you're working with, especially directors you you like to work with. And and because because when you're in film school and when you're starting out, you're really focused on your part in 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 the in this in this machine. And uh, and I think it's. Um, you have to learn, or at least I have to learn to listen and to 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 actually understand what's going on around me and and what kind of story that person who's directing or writing that movie is trying to tell. And I think that's uh, that's something I was important for me. Yeah, Mark, how about you? Yeah, um, I think for me, one of the things I keep going back to is. Um, you know, we do very complicated work sometimes, and 
I try to simplify. I try to find what the scene is about. What's the best? What's the core thing that you're you're trying to find in this? Whether it's a a character study or a story point. And whenever I've done that, it always helps. It always helps you strip away the complexities, the things that don't need to be in the frame that you shouldn't be worried about. Um, kind of helps distill the scene down to its most important elements. And that's been a real gutting principle um, for, for myself. And also um, the crew, the crew is, it's all about the crew. I mean, I have just, you know, my my uh, my gaffers, Jay Yowler, Key Grip, Paul Schmidt, they're just amazing. They get along great. Just a pleasure to come to work. I've got, you know, Robert Shear, Michael Kleiman, the focus pullers I'm, I'm working with. They're just all just, you know, easygoing. They look, everybody looks out for each other. You know, they look out for me. You know, they keep me from making a mistake. Like we just all, you know, take care of each other. And that is really, you know, that season four, we had no hiatus and um, went straight through January through, you know, the summer. And uh, I think we finished in, Ju in June or July. In June, end of June, and um, man, that's a that is hard, you know, to not have any breaks. And and I even had had a six day week, a seven day week, and a six day week at some point. That I had to prep on the weekend, and you just need help around you. And so the the crew is just incredibly important that you that you bring with you. And uh, yeah, they're all amazing. Yeah, David, have you a good piece of advice or something you've carried through with you uh, in your career? Uh, right before I shot my first feature a very small film I ran into Alan Davia on the streets of Hollywood and he, he told me um, know your first week's work backwards and forwards you know and I take that to mean that basically if you know the first few days or weeks been on your size of your project thoroughly like every setup every light you want to do in your head it'll go so smoothly that it'll set the right tone for the rest of the show by the second week third week a lot of decisions are based on the first week's work in terms of the style you've, you've set up and, and the flow of things and how you work with the actors. But um, it helps to start on the right foot by really being prepared. So that's the thing that I, I keep in mind if I can, is just be almost over prepared for the first few days at least. So it goes as, like clockwork. That's awesome. Great, great, uh, great person, great man on the street uh, bumping into there. That's a, not, not every day you get to do that and and then jake for you your last uh last one here um those are all great uh great anecdotes and advice um i don't i don't have a specific piece of advice that was given to me i do remember early on i happened to be spending time with this manager uh who was managing an actor on a on a tv set and i had told him this was like my second year of film school i think and I told him, like, I want to be a DP. You know, that's what I want to do professionally. And he said, you'll never make it. You're way too nice. <laughs> and, and I thought, well, that's fascinating. And I think, like, it kind of goes along with everyone talking about um, the importance of working with people and trusting people you're working with. I think that there is room to, to do what we do and, and be, be a nice person, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, you don't, you don't have to uh, be tyrannical and... Uh, you know, just, I, I don't know. I think there's, there's this idea that, that that is the way things have to be sometimes or this myth of, of, of that kind of uh, personality. And I've met so many just like sweet, sensitive people that are also, you know, very focused, very good at what they do. And uh, anyway, that's just kind of, that struck me as everyone's Kind of talking about that yeah i think that sounds great and like all of you all obviously have worked frequently with the uh, same collaborators and same crew and the work i think speaks for itself there as well we're going to wrap up here but i just want to again christian spranger uh from atlanta marcel rev from euphoria mark doring paul gronish and david mullen the marvelous mrs mazel and jake kerber from rupaul's drag race all emmy nominees this year for their cinematography incredible work please check it out and thank you all for doing this thank you thank you chris thank you thank you, thank you.